I would like to thank everybody for coming tonight. And um, this is a program I have presented before to some different groups and most of the groups like it. And as Taisha said, we will be not only seeing local birds, but I've thrown in a few uh, worldwide birds that have some interesting nests and behaviors. So uh, here we go. First of all, we're gonna talk about unusual songs or calls. As a birder myself, I recognize birds uh, by IDing them. A really good birder knows all their songs and calls and can recognize that just from hearing them, what the bird is. I am not very good at that. If they say their name, however, I'm good at it. So here's some examples of birds that say their name or they have a mnemonic that you can kind of store away in your memory bank and recall that when you hear it out in the woods. <clears throat> For instance, this is the barred owl. And I might show you over here, this is a range map and it shows you where the bird is at certain times of year. You can see the barred owl doesn't really migrate, but it's in this purple area all year long. If it migrated, there would be a yellow streak. And if it's winter only, the blue and summer would be the kind of reddish color. But you can see it's down here in Mexico and then all over uh, Eastern United States and a little bit up here in Canada. So this is the barred owl <clears throat> and its mnemonic is, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all? And so I'll play it here and you can kind of get an idea. I hope you can hear this on your computer. So did, could you hear that? Taisha, could you hear that? Yes, okay? we, yes, we could hear that. Okay, good. And it didn't exactly say who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, but you can get glimpses of that throughout. Uh, area and it is called a white breasted nuthatch and you can see he's on the bark of this tree and if you notice his bill looks kind of like a chisel and that's because he will go up and down and around the tree bark flipping bits of bark off looking for insects and larvae underneath the bark and so his beak is well adapted to help him in his environment to be able to feed. His song or call is nyet, nyet, nyet. And it reminds me of the Three Stooges when they used to go nyet, nyet, nyet all the time. And you can see he's pretty well represented over the whole United States. <laughs> So if you happen to hear that, look for this bird twining around the tree trunk. Sometimes he goes down head first. Sometimes he's upside down. Sometimes he's right side up. But he's a pretty uh, funny little bird, and especially with that call. <clears throat> now, this bird is called a gray cat bird. And you can notice that it's not with us all year long, but it's in our area to breed. So summertime right now, he is breeding and you might be able to hear him. He's just a pretty gray bird, but he has this black cap and he's got, this is called their vent or their, I call it their butt and it's reddish. So, 
You don't often see him immediately, but you will hear him because he sounds like a cat mewing. Often people are walking down the sidewalk and there'll be a bunch of bushes there. He likes to hide in bushes and they'll hear this and they'll think there's a little cat or kitten over there. And it happens to be this bird. But as you can see, he's usually well conce uh, concealed in the branches and in the leaves of the tree. But listen for that mew-like sound. Here's a bird that on first impulse, you think, oh, it's a robin. And then you notice in this left picture, well, it doesn't really have a full red breast. And the flanks are that red color. This is an Eastern towhee. And again, you can see he breeds in our area here, but he probably, we don't see him as much in the winter. His song or mnemonic is drink your tea. Can you hear the drink your tea? And he is usually on the ground where you see him most. And he usually is flipping over the leaves and leaf litter or pine needles. And he'll be on the ground scratching, looking again for bugs to eat. <coughs> Excuse me. The Northern Mockingbird is a real common bird. I really like this bird. He gets a little aggressive sometimes, but he's a fun bird to listen to. And you can see he's all over the United States. And he's an easy bird to recognize because he's a gray bird. He has a long tail. And when he flies, he's got this white outer feathers on his tail and these big, bold wing white bars. So he's real easy to identify. And then when you listen to him, he's called a mockingbird and he mocks other sounds, mostly bird sounds. But he might hear a cardinal and he'll imitate the cardinal. And then he'll hear a chickadee and he'll imitate the chickadee. And at first you're thinking, well, there's a chickadee here. And then he goes off on this repertoire of about 200 different songs and you go, no, that's the mockingbird. <laughs> so he usually uh, sings this in patterns of three, but not always. Whoops, hold on, let's go back. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of their <laughs> repertoire. But then I think they figured out that he has about 200 different uh, songs that he can call out. So he's a pretty fun bird to listen to. He often is sitting out on top of bushes. He likes to make his nest inside of the bush and he gets very territorial. Uh, you may have heard stories about people on college campuses walking down the sidewalks, going to their classes and being dive bombed by a mockingbird because they got too close to his nest. Mm. So that happens. All right, warblers. Uh, we are in the central flyway that goes up and down the Mississippi River. So during the spring and fall, during migration, we are kind of in line with all of these warblers. Uh, a lot of them head out of South America or Central America, and they come up into the United States and Canada to breed, and then they go back uh, and, and winter their 
winter sometimes is very mild uh, in these in the Central America and South America. Uh, we have a lot of warblers that come through and uh, the warbler migration has passed. So now if they're on breeding grounds, which this black and white warbler, you can see he does breed in Southwest Missouri. Um, so he's probably on a nest and you won't hear his uh, singing as much as you would, but he sounds like a squeaky wheel. And I used to have hamsters and rats and they would run and run and run and run on their, on their squeaky wheel. So, so if you would hear that squeak out in the forest, this is a forest, it's a wood warbler. So if you would hear that, I'll play it again. Then that would be this black and white warbler. They're small birds. They're hard to detect because they're up at high in the uh, tree canopy, hidden be between the leaves. But this is guy is a little active guy. And you can see he runs along the limbs. He may be upside down or right side up. So, okay, another bird that we have in our area that's here all year long is the Carolina chickadee. Now, somebody goes, probably is saying, well, I thought we had black capped chickadees. Well, black cat chickadees are all the way through the United States, but in our area, the southeastern portion of the United States, it's called a Carolina chickadee. And if you put two of them side by side, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But the difference is in their song. So our Carolina chickadee says chickadee dee dee. And the other chickadee makes a different type of chickadee dee dee song. Oops, let me go back again. Where are we here? Here we are. So he's saying chickadee dee dee um, and <clears throat> you notice he's got a caterpillar in her, in her, his mouth. Uh, when they nest, they may have six or seven eggs. And when those eggs hatch, in order to get that brood to fly away, they have to feed them over 9,000 caterpillars for one clutch of baby birds. That's a lot of caterpillars. All right, this is an Eastern Phoebe. Again, it breeds in Missouri and it's a type of flycatcher. Notice he's got some kind of big insect in his uh, mouth. You often see him perched on a stick like this or a stump and they'll sit there and they'll move their heads back and forth looking for an insect. And then all of a sudden they'll fly off of that stick and catch the insect. And then they usually come back to that same perch again so you can get a better look at them. But uh, they actually say their name, Phoebe. I like it when they say their names. Okay, so those are some of our common birds that are around now that you might see. And I thought we'd also get into some unusual displays or behaviors. A lot of people set up uh, feeding stations in their yard and bird baths, and they will get a certain amount of species coming as yard birds. And if you continue to watch them, a lot of times they have pretty unique displays or behaviors, especially their mating displays. This one you would not find in your yard. In fact, you can see its territory is very limited. And in Missouri, it just kind of gets into the northern part of our state. This is an endangered 
prairie chicken. Uh, <clears throat> all of the prairie chickens are, there's several different species, are losing habitat because we're plowing over the old prairies. Missouri used to have lots of prairies in the state. Now we're less than 1% of all of uh, the prairie that we used to have. So their habitat is diminished. Now this guy, this isn't a feather or anything. He has been, uh, <clears throat> he's got a transmitter put on him in order to track his behavior and everything. But what they do is these prairie chickens come out on leks and leks are ancestral breeding grounds. In other words, even as these prairie chickens die off and hatch new ones, years and years and centuries, they have come to this one spot to make displays and to try to get a mate. So that is a lek. And they, you can't see it real well here, but this pouch right here on both sides, it can inflate to about five times its size. And they make a booming sound when they are, the males do when they are displaying for the female. This is the male over here, and this is the female. And they also do dances. So they boom and they dance. This is up in northern Missouri, and we had to get into this blind here before daybreak. And out here on this prairie, this is their ancestral lek. And we had to be very, very quiet in there. This is during winter also. And, and just as dawn starts creeping, um, the sun starts creeping up, these, you'll see these birds coming out on the lek. And then they start, these are all males, and you can see how they fly up in the air and they do this booming sound and do this dance, trying to attract the female in. So it's a pretty interesting bird and it will be a shame if they go extinct. Okay, another bird is the American red star. Again, you can see breeds in our territory. This is actually a type of warbler that comes up from South and Central America, migrates up here, and then breeds in Canada and the Eastern United States. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the male. The female is a little lightly colored, almost yellow instead of orange. And they have a unique behavior in that when they're up in the trees, they fan their wings and they fan their tail. It's kind of like a jittering motion. And what they are doing is you can see the tree leaves are just starting to come out and all of the insects are coming in uh, to feast on the berries and everything. And so these insects that are in the tree get spooked by this movement and the bird gets to eat the insects that are flying around. So that's a way that they can feed. This guy is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Now, some of you are probably not old enough to remember the honeymooners, but Art Carney would always come in and say something about the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And I always thought it was a joke bird. I didn't think there really was a yellow-bellied sapsucker, but there is. This guy is a type of woodpecker. And if you notice this tree here, he will make little holes all the way across the tree. So if you're ever in the woods and you see a tree like this, you'll know that that woodpecker, the yellow-bellied sapsucker, has been there. Now, he's called a sapsucker because he drills holes into the wood to get sap to run. Not only does he lick the sap with his long tongue, but the sap attracts insects and the insects get stuck in the sap. And so the woodpecker not only gets sap, but insects to eat. Here's a, a close up of his, <laughs> the picture here of all the holes. So in the winter, we have them and then they migrate and mostly breed up into the Canada or 
the northern United States. The kestrel, one of my favorite birds. This is an American kestrel. And uh, you can see, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. S see that he's in our area most of um, all the time. Uh, people don't realize this bird is only about the size of a robin. He's our very smallest falcon. The, the male has kind of a grayish blue tint to his wings and head and back, whereas the female is more brown. He will hover in the air. He looks like he's flittering and, and actually flying still. And what he does is he's looking with his really sharp vision down into the pasture grasses looking for little moles and voles and mice and stuff like that. And when he actually finally sees one, then he makes a dive down into the grass and clutches that mouse uh, with his talons. <clears throat> the peregrine falcon. We used to have some peregrine falcons in our Midwest part of the United States. And we still do have some nesting on high rise buildings in big cities like St. Louis and Minneapolis, but mostly they're found in the West on high cliffs. They like high areas to make their nest. <clears throat> this bird is also a falcon, but he's much larger than the kestrel. When he dives, he can dive at 200 miles an hour. His feet are much bigger than the kestrel. And what he does when he's flying along, he balls up his, his toes into a tight ball and he will attack other birds that are flying. So he drops coming at 200 miles an hour with his balled up fist, he knocks that bird in the head and breaks its neck. And then that bird is like fluttering down to earth and he comes and swoops by and grabs him and then takes him to a limb or a cliff or something to defeather him and eat him. So this is a very spectacular, ferocious hunter. And although this picture doesn't show up very well, his eyeliner that he uses is a bright yellow and the nares on his nose is a bright yellow, which is really um, makes for a pretty falcon. Well, here he is again. Now, this is, this is a fun little bird. This is a uh, shore bird, it's known as, and it's a killdeer. You've probably seen them around. They like to nest in gravel or short grass. Um, if you have a gravel driveway, one might be there. I was riding my bike on the Katy Trail. Uh, that is not, it's just kind of uh, crushed limestone and sometimes uh, wood chips. And there was a nest in the middle of the trail and the female flew up and tried to knock me off my bike because I got too close to her nest. So this is the killdeer. They have, these are baby killdeer. You can see how tiny they are, but they have these long legs. And here are their eggs that are pretty well camouflaged in gravel. I always look at the, the youngsters as a cotton ball on toothpicks. That's about what they look like. But the interesting thing is, if you get too close to the nest, the bird will, like I said, uh, you know, swarm down at you. It will start making uh, a, a display like it has a broken wing and it goes around in a circle and this wing is flopping up and down and it acts like it has a, a broken wing and he, she'll do that away from the nest. So if there's a predator looking to eat the eggs, 
say like a fox or something, then she's making this broken wing display and he gets distracted with her display and comes over to see what all the ruckus is thinking, well, okay, I'll just eat this bird and then she'll fly away. Or she'll put puff up, puff up real big and, and make sounds and again, go in a circle and try to distract any predators. So you might see this happening sometime. It's pretty cool. She also, after she has her babies, uh, <clears throat> I, I saw a killdeer once out in the field and I looked and I go, well, that killdeer has eight legs. And it's because she puts her, her little babies under her breast and puts her wings around them to keep them warm. And so if you happen to see an eight legged killdeer, <laughs> it's just the mother and the babies. This is a really elegant bird. It's the state bird of Oklahoma. You can see it nests in mostly Oklahoma and Texas, but also Kansas and Missouri. Uh, <clears throat> these guys like to be on telephone wires, bobbed wires. Um, if you go out to Lake Springfield, uh, you can see them on the wires out there, uh, out in the country, in pasture land, they'll be out. But the cool thing about it, it's called a scissor tail flycatcher. And the male's tail is probably about 18 inches long. Could you imagine having that much drag on your body when you're trying to fly? But his mating display for the female, whose tail is only about a foot long, is he'll fly way up in the air and he uh, opens and closes his tail back and forth, back and forth. And he'll do loop-de-loos and uh, make this song display and uh, trying to attract the female. He is a flycatcher and that's what he catches in midair, different types of insects to eat. So he's a, he's a cool bird. Now, one of my favorite birds, and you'll probably say, oh my gosh, how can you like a turkey vulture? Well, it is nature's garbage man. If we didn't have vultures, we would have a lot of dead carcasses laying around our roadways. The raccoons and the possums and uh, all the other little critters that get hit and some of the animals that die in the forest would just lay there and rot and be really smelly. But thank goodness for the turkey vulture. The turkey vulture can digest rotting flesh without any problems at all. In fact, they have used turkey vultures in scientific studies to try to figure out how to combat botulism. You know, humans get botulism uh, from eating uh, food that is spoiled, but they don't have any trouble at all. The acids in their stomach are so strong that they break down all that bacteria and get rid of it. Now, the turkey vulture is called a turkey vulture because of his reddish head uh, that kind of looks like a turkey. We also have black vultures in the area. They are an all black bird, but if they're flying in the air and you can see their head, you can see the turkey vultures is red, whereas the black is black, but also the wing coloration. The turkey vulture has kind of a grayish silver lining on the backside of their wings and the end of their tail. The black vulture has a shorter, wider tail, and he only has this coloring on his wing tips. So it's real easy to see these guys when they're soaring. And they soar all day long. They will get on a high silo, branch, whatever, in the morning, and they'll spread their wings way out. Let's see if I have a picture, yeah. And they are soaking up the sun rays to warm up. And then they lift up on the thermals that the, the heat of the earth gives off. And they can soar, glide in the air all day long without flapping. 
wouldn't that be amazing? It'd be like being in a glider plane and you don't have any like really propeller or anything. You're just gliding using the wind to your advantage. Well, that's what they do. Now, these turkey vultures are pretty interesting fellows. I told you that they have really acidic acids in their stomach that break down all this carrion and everything. And um, the black vultures actually have a little bit stronger beak. And the turkey vulture, if you can see those nostrils, can smell really good. The black vultures don't smell quite as well. The turkey vulture just can smell something dead over two miles away. So they lead the whole group of turkey vultures to this dead animal. The turkey, the black vulture comes along and opens the carcass up, and then the turkey vulture will eat the inside. So they kind of share their duties. The turkey vulture's feet are very weak. Uh, a hawk if you would hold a hawk on your arm, it would squeeze your arm and probably draw blood. The turkey vulture wasn't, wouldn't do that. But the hawk catches live prey that they have to control. The vulture is standing on something dead. He doesn't have to control that. Now, a lot of times you will see turkey vultures alongside of the road when you're driving past. Occasionally, they'll be in the middle of the road on a carcass. And you, you probably think, <clears throat> okay, it's just going to fly away when I get close to it. Well, not always. Because they're kind of like me. When I sit down to eat, I like to really pack it in. And so they'll eat and eat and eat. And they overstuff themselves so much that they can't fly. They are too heavy to fly. So what they have to do is let that acid work on the meat and it breaks it down pretty quickly before they can fly off. So if you're speeding along the highway 60 miles an hour and see this turkey vulture in the middle of the road and expect it to get up and fly away, you may end up with a turkey vulture in your lap after it breaks through your windshield. So be careful, I would go around it or slow down. <laughs> Another interesting thing about this is, let's say he's eating this armadillo alongside the road and a fox comes up thinking, ooh, I think I'm gonna get me a, a turkey vulture for dinner. Well, the turkey vulture, he can't fly away. He's eating too much. He can waddle away, but the fox would catch him. So he just throws his head back and regurgitates or vomits on the fox. <laughs> and he can spew his stomach contents about 25 feet. So that fox has all this deteriorating, acidic, bacteria-laden food in its eyes. It can't see. It's whimpering. And it's got its paws up on its eyes trying to get that out of the way. Meanwhile, the turkey vulture kind of like parades off into the woods until she is able to digest all her food. Therefore, she has saved herself from being eaten by the fox. Pretty cool bird. Here's another funny looking bird. Um, it's called a woodcock. It's related to a snipe. You've probably heard about taking kids on a snipe hunt with their gunny sack in the middle of the woods. Well, we do have snipes. And we do have these woodcocks. And these woodcocks uh, <clears throat> make a real strange display um, on their, in their habitat. And they will go way, way up in the air and then they'll fall back to earth. And then they'll go way up and they'll make this, the sound of the woodcock and then they fall back to earth all in their display and they usually do this right at dusk and it, it's a little bit harder to see them. But you can see how their eye is really pretty big for their head and it, it's located right there and their beak is so long. 
One other bird that has an interesting behavior, and we're not seeing quite as many loggerhead shrikes. Um, this shrike, its bill is hooked. Okay, most hooked beaks come from raptors, but this is not a raptor, but he does have a hooked beak. And uh, <clears throat> you can see he's caught, this is a, a type of lizard. He's, he's caught a mouse here. This is a grasshopper, but they are impaled on thorn trees, on barbed wire. And if you see any of these little creatures stuck, on barbed wire, you, you're thinking, well, how did they get stuck there? What happened? What's the situation? Well, a shrike has come along and caught him, and he's not ready to eat right now. So he sticks him on a thorn, and he comes back to eat him later. The burrowing owl is one of my favorite owls. It's an owl that can be out during the day or the, uh, the night. You will see them uh, usually in desert type country, but they also have them up in Nebraska, on the plains, in California, down in Florida. And they use burrows instead of uh, holes and trees. They don't dig these burrows themselves, but prairie dogs or other animals that dig burrows, they will use those as their nesting homes. In fact, in, uh, uh, what is the name, Gables in Florida, there's a housing division down there. And when they put the housing division in, they noticed they were on the breeding grounds of the burrowing owls. And so the homeowners, in order to buy the home, had to say that they would protect the, the nesting areas of these birds. So they live in conjunction with the birds out in their front yard. And they always make these kind of, sometimes they look upside down or sideways at you and you can see how long their legs are. Uh, but they're a smaller owl. They're not as big as like our great horned or our uh, uh, barred owl, but they're a the cute little owl. This is another bird. This, this one's found in the Southwest, but it's such a funny little bird. He's called an acorn woodpecker, but he looks like a clown to me. And some of his things are kind of clownish. He will get telephone poles or uh, acorn trees, you know, oak trees, and he will drill holes in there. And then he puts the acorns in there like he's storing them. And he not only stores them and then comes back and eats them, but every once in a while he comes and he turns the nuts in the hole so they get baked evenly by the sun. So <laughs> he's got nice little treats. Another cool little bird uh, is the American Dipper. And he actually swims with his wings underwater. He likes cold, rushing streams in very fast water. And he'll often be found on a gray rock. He's a gray bird like that. And he will actually look under the water. He dives under the water and swims underwater. And what is he's looking for are larvae and insect and eggs and stuff like that. And he can actually swim upstream in this, you know, rapid type water uh, to catch his food. I just returned from a trip to Alaska and uh, we were up here and we saw the crossbills. And if you ever see, they do come through Missouri in the winter time uh, rarely, but they do come through. And you see a bird like this that has a funky beak and you go, oh my gosh, he's deformed the poor bird. How does he eat? But actually his beak has adapted to pine cones. He will insert his beak into the pine cone. And when he opens it, it flanges these pine cones out so that the pine nut will drop out. 
And so if he didn't have this kind of beak, he wouldn't be able to eat the pine nuts. So it's a, a very unique adaptation for this bird. So they have red wing and white wing crossbills. Um, something that's kind of concerning up in Alaska, a lot of the spruce were dead uh, because of the spruce bark beetle that is killing these trees. Uh, it only takes two or three years for them to kill a tree once they've infested it. And then these dried out trees are easy fire material. So we saw a lot of evidence of fires throughout Alaska. If a lot of those trees get decimated, then the crossbills won't have as much food to forage on. This is a funny bird. Look at its feet. Can you believe those toes? Mm -mm. The, those are the toes. This is the actual ankle right here. His knee is up here. Okay, that's the ankle. These are toes. And he is called a jacana. He's usually found in uh, uh, rainforest climates like that. Sometimes he's called the Jesus bird because he can walk on water or a lily trotter because he trots across the lilies. And you again can see these long toes and he's in marshy areas. The thing I like about this bird, here he is a lily trotter. The female will make a nest, the male and female make a nest on a lily pad or some floating vegetation. And then after they mate, the female will lay the eggs and then she flies away and says, honey, it's your job, you take care of the babies. And so he sits on the, uh, on the eggs, incubates them and then has to feed all the babies and she just takes off little different. Here is a baby. Check the baby. And it's, it has to grow into its feet. Another interesting bird are the, or a couple of birds, is the yellow-billed and the red-billed oxpeckers. And they're found in Africa. And that's what they do. They peck on oxen, or in this case, a giraffe. Here's, um, you know, this big guy and here's the bird on his face. This is one of the most dangerous animals in Africa, the Cape Buffalo. Yet this bird can walk all over his face, get in his nose, his nostrils on his back. And they are taking off, off ticks and flies and different insects that would bother that beast. And so... About everywhere you go in Africa, you know, the hippopotamus even have them on there, the zebras. And so, okay, the bower birds are in Australia and Papua New Guinea. And there's a lot of different species of these bower birds. Um, this one happens to be a satin bower bird. This is called a regent's bower bird. And they're uh, they range in d dark colors to yellow. Um, what they do, you can see the stick bower. The male makes a bower, and each species of bower bird makes a different looking bower. This is not a nest, okay? It's like a shrine. It's a shrine for his female mate. And so he will make this grass shrine and then he will decorate it. Each species has a different color that they like. This bower bird likes blue. So anything, a bottle cap, a straw, anything, blue flowers, he decorates. He, and he'll fly and bring all this stuff in to his bower, hoping to attract a mate. Whoops, sorry. What happens is he'll sing and he'll toss these in the air and move them around. If a female comes and inspects the bower, hmm, this is pretty nice looking. If she walks through the bower, that means she accepts him as a mate. And then they will mate and have young, but their nest will be made up in the tree. 
This is just foreplay, getting them attracted. This is a really funny bird, too. These are called mannequins, and they're down in South America. And uh, tiny little squatty body birds. These are all the males. And the females are usually just a dull color brown. But boy, do the males go through a lot of action in trying to attract a mate. Okay, here's the female. Here's the male. Okay, let me see if I can get this going. This is live actual speed of his movement with his toes along the branches. This is also called a lek site. And this is where for centuries these birds have come to perform. It's usually a horizontal branch. And he performs trying to attract a mate. <laughs> Here's the female. Hmm. <laughs> but a lot of birds have interesting dances that they do in order to attract a mate. Unusual nests. <clears throat> Every bird species has a different kind of nest. And if you learn the nest, then you can learn what kind of bird's going to be there. This is the American tree swallow. If you've ever been out at Lake Springfield or Fellows Lake, you probably notice there's bird boxes out there and cavity nesters nest in those, mostly bluebirds, but also a lot of tree swallows nest in them. You can see the tree swallow is all over this area. I saw them uh, up in Alaska when I was up there and this is their breeding territory. A very iridescent bird, very pretty bird. And in the box, they make a nest out of grass that's very nice and even. And the bluebird will make the same kind of nest with grass. But the tree swallow adds feathers to it. And these feathers arch over the nest. So when I open the box to check it, I monitor the boxes out there. The eggs are laid down in the bottom here, and a lot of times the female bird is smushed down into the nest and you don't see her at first. And as I part the feathers, then I see that little beady eye looking up at me and she's sitting on her eggs. But I think it's a really pretty nest that they make. Here's a, an example of the egg. No, these are babies. See the tiny little baby heads? Mm -hmm. Okay, another pretty bird that comes through is the Baltimore Oriole. Um, and uh, in late April, early May, you may hear people getting oranges and grape jelly at the grocery store. And they put these out on nails and the Baltimore Orioles that are migrating through will land on those. They'll also land on cups of grape jelly. One lady that's in our bird group bought 38 jars of grape jelly that were eaten by the Orioles going through on migration, which only lasts about two or three weeks. So they ate a lot of grape jelly. Their nest, now we have had some that breed at uh, Fellows Lake and not always, always this far south, but we do have some out there. But you can see their nest is kind of a long uh, cylindrical nest, but a very striking bird. Our ruby-throated hummingbird, there's um, almost 40 species of hummingbirds in North America and South America, well, not South America, but in North America. And we just have the one that's the prominent one, ruby-throated. 
Um, this is the size of their nest. They oh put God. it on the twig. They take lichen, spider webs, and stuff to make their nest. And then they always lay two little jelly bean size eggs. And then these are the guys when they're hatched. And they eat a lot of bugs when they're little. Now, this bird's coming to a nectar feeding uh, hummingbird feeder. And uh, for those of you that put out hummingbird feeders, uh, you need to make a solution of one part sugar to four parts water. You can boil it or just put it in really hot water to dissolve it. You do not need to put in red dye. They found that the red dye is sometimes toxic to the birds. So all you need is these little red flowers uh, to bring them to the feeder. This is the pileated woodpecker, which is our largest woodpecker. It's about a foot in length. Uh, this is where Woody Woodpecker got his claim to fame. And if you're ever out in the deep woods, you will hear them and they almost sound like they're laughing. They're very raucous. And they make this big hole in these trees uh, uh, that probably go down about a foot and their babies are you know, the eggs are laid in there and their babies ha sometimes have their heads sticking out uh, when they're being fed. Did you know, you know, woodpeckers wrap pretty hard on the wood and you would think they would have a headache. Their tongue, when they stick their tongue out, it can go out about this far, but it actually wraps around their head like this and it acts as a sponge and it protects their brain when they're actually tapping or knocking on the tree. Well, here's our America symbol, uh, the bald eagle, beautiful bird. Missouri attracts a lot of eagles in the winter time because they migrate south down to all of our open waterways because they're fish eaters. If any of you have seen eagle programs put on by the zoo, this is a 32 year old eagle, Phoenix, that is still doing programs. So. Their nests are huge. The biggest nest they ever found was down in Florida that toppled a sycamore tree. It weighed two tons and they could actually drive a VW Beetle into the nest. That's how big it was. They mate for life, so they come back to the nest, the same nest, year after year. And being a female bird, she'll take all the rotten twigs out, and the male will bring her new twigs, so she inserts it into the nest. And sometimes she likes to make her nest bigger, make her home a bigger home. And so they get to be gigantuous. This bird, the weaver bird, is a bird of um, Africa. And the weaver birds will make all of these nests. One bird may make all of these nests, one male bird. And he's trying to attract a female. So the female will go around here checking all these out. Oh, this one's too small, this one's too big. Oh, this one's just right. And she'll go in their nest. And then all these other nests are just kind of out there. But every once in a while, a snake will come up the tree and he'll come out and he'll go in the nest to try to find eggs to eat. But, you know, after he's gone through 12 or 15 nests and not found any eggs, he gives up. So this is a way for them to protect the young from predators. This is a weaver bird here and they actually, one uh, reed or piece of grass at a time come and weave it with their beak. This one, sorry, this one makes uh, a circle to start out with and eventually it will be a very big ball that he makes. I watched this guy in Africa making this nest. It was pretty cool. Plumages. 
This is the cedar waxwing, which is such an elegant looking bird. Uh, you know, it's got this little crest and this beautiful black spot here. And then it's got um, wax-like coloring on the wings on the tip of the tail. A long time ago when people would write letters, sometimes they would seal the letter with a drop of wax and then push in some kind of thing that made an inscription or your letter of your first name or something, and they would mail those. And that's what, how they got their name, a wax wing. These come, come through in flocks in the spring. This is called a rose-breasted grosbeak. And he almost looks like he has a bleeding heart. The female is a lot, it's pinker rather than red. It's about the size of a robin. The painted bunting is probably our most colorful North American bird. They nest at the quarry out in Willard. That's a great place to find them. This is the female, blah and drab, but she's trying to, when she's sitting on the eggs, she doesn't want to be bright like the male who is trying to show off his different colors to attract a mate, but she doesn't want to attract predators to her nest. And then these are the wood warblers that come through. These aren't great pictures, but that's a braid best breasted, a magnolia, a lot of oranges and yellows in this, chestnut sided. This is a parola. This guy, we call this the masked bandit. Um, it's a type of yellow throat. Now, this is not a bird of North America. This is a bird that I first saw in Africa, and this was my aha bird. In other words, I really wasn't that interested in birds. I was looking at the big mammals. But when I saw this bird, I went, oh my gosh, look at the colors. This is the lilac breasted roller. And its mating display is turning in circles in the air. And it's got a little bit of a forked tail, but the coloration was so beautiful on this bird. And that got me to liking birds. A penguin. This is used to be called the jackass penguin because when he brays, it sounds like a donkey braying. But they thought, well, maybe that was a little crass. Maybe we should just name him African penguin. So they changed his name. But this is him and his burrow or her with her baby. And of course, they don't fly. But if you put them in water, it looks like they're flying underwater. A rock hopper penguin. <laughs> you can find these also in Antarctica and the South Falkland Islands and the tips of South America. Now, how about a blue footed booby? Who would think that somebody's feet would so, be so colorful that they would attract a mate just by dancing? See how they dance? They go from one foot to the other and they dance uh, to attract their mate. They just have a little scratch in the grass or the sand that is their, their spot. And they do all this cooing and different posturing and dancing. Uh, these can be found in the Galapagos Islands. So it's a pretty funny little bird. And one of our biggest birds that we have, this is a non-flying cassowary found in Australia and Papua New Guinea, huge bird. Uh, I've seen him in the San Diego Zoo and also in Australia. But if you wanna get a good look at him, go to the San Diego Zoo. These are about as big as an ostrich. And they have this funny little cask on top of their head that is hollow so that when they uh, make sounds, it echoes out of that and it travels further. They have this big long waddle and these huge feet. In fact, they can kill humans with a kick of their feet.
pretty cool bird. <laughs> now, I'll just quickly, do we still have time? Are we all right? Or do we need to wrap this up? Are we doing okay on time? I think we're doing okay on time if you're just going to go through a few quick more. Yeah, quick. Just attracting birds to your own backyard. Here's our state bird, the bluebird. And uh, over 50 million people watch birds, many in their own backyard. We have about 900 species of birds in North America. 400 of those are in Missouri. So, uh, and we have 150 that nest in our state. So we have ample opportunities to see these birds. You just need three things, good quality seed or food, fresh water for drinking and bathing, and then native shelter. Uh, some different types of foods that you can get. Like if you buy at like Walmart and that kind of place, a lot of times they give you a mixture uh, that has a lot of seed that birds don't eat and they just throw it on the ground and then you have different types of plants growing in your yard. So it's better to buy the more expensive bird feed. Uh, Niger uh, is the type of feed for, uh-oh, What happened? How do I get back there? If you do not want this, you can. Uh oh. Well, we may be. We're still seeing the slide that says food and feeders. Okay, here we are. Okay. These are uh, goldfinch. They like the Niger. The cardinals. Uh, sometimes we'll like this white bird seed. It's called safflower. You want to draw a lot of them to your backyard, uh, like the cardinals grape or the Orioles grape jelly and oranges. Uh, the woodpeckers, you can get suet cakes, but don't use those in the summer because they get rancid. So use those in the fall and the spring. And a lot of times, if you put them in these hangers that are upside down, the woodpeckers can get to them, but the other birds like blue jays and those can't get to them as well. They have uh, cakes like this. Guys, dang it. Why do I keep? Okay. Bluebirds love mealworms. You can actually purchase mealworms that are alive and you can keep them in your refrigerator. I wouldn't exactly say to eat them, but they can, can be kept in your refrigerator. And then the black oil sunseed, uh, our seed is probably your best overall choice. A bird bath or some kind of water feature, one that drips is as or has a little fountain, really attracts the birds. You can also get those heated in the winter time, which is really great because a lot of times birds want to have a water source that is open. And so if we get iced over or a lot of snow and you have a heated bird bath, you'll attract a lot. And then some kind of shelter, different kinds of nesting boxes, uh, wild natural habitat uh, is good so that as they go over to the feeder, if a, a Cooper's hawk comes in to try to nab a bird, they have uh, some territory they can fly quickly to, to save themselves. And so some of our uh, bird, most common feeder birds that you would see, this is the American goldfinch. This is what it looks like in the winter time. And then in the summertime, the male will be this pretty yellow color. Here's our Carolina chickadee. Oops, here we go again. Carolina chickadee, the tufted titmouse. These are house finches. The male is more beautifully colored than the female. She's streaky. The northern cardinal, female, male. And then woodpeckers often come to suet feeders. This is the hairy woodpecker, which looks a lot like the downy, but his beak is bigger than hers. It's a stubby little beak. And then the red-bellied woodpecker, although he doesn't have a red belly, it has a blush of red on it, but he's got a red head, but we already have a red-headed woodpecker, so they had to call him something else. 
So that's all, folks. And I hope you've learned a little bit about birds and maybe um, found out some of their behavior is pretty amazing and how they mate and how they migrate and everything. And uh, hopefully you'll watch some birds. Yes, thank you so much, Sue, for sharing all your information. Um, I've always, I always learn something every time I hear you talk about the birds. Um, one, I'm also, you know, a lover of the turkey vulture. I really like that bird. So I'm glad that you talked <laughs> about that bird. And that little baby, was it a jacana? Was really cute. It did look like a little sort of fuzzy cotton ball. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there, uh, I think there's some questions coming through. Uh, so Teresa Young asked, she said, thank you for sharing your birding experiences around the world. Did you take the pictures you shared in the program yourself? Uh, all of them I took with the exception of, uh, I got a few images off of Google and I think I put down Google next to the picture if I, I got them, but I took a lot of those pictures. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sue, have you been to um, every continent? I have. I've been to all the continents and uh, I keep a bird list, which is kind of vague right now, but I have about probably 3,500 to 4,000 bird species that I've seen. And we have a little over 10,000 in the world. So I have, I probably don't have enough time to find all the birds. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Um, another good question that came through was from Kathy. She says, do you use a bird ad identification app? And if so, what kind? Okay, um, I'm kind of old school. I still have the bird guides that I take around, uh, but there's a very good uh, way to keep track of all the birds that you see and their locations and the time of year. And it's called eBird. If you go to Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that's kind of our main bird university in the United States in Ithaca, New York, uh, they have lots of apps. Merlin is the name of one app that's very good for trying to identify birds in your backyard or around. iBird is another uh, good app. If you go to foreign countries, you can actually download the app for that country and the birds that they have in that country. And it's just like having a birding guide on your phone. And so uh, it's amazing. Um, if you go to All About Birds, that's a website that is uh, made through Cornell. They have pictures and information and bird songs and calls of just about every bird in the world. So it's a, a great website to go for information. 